Well, good morning, everyone. How's everybody, everyone doing post-Memorial Day weekend? We had a great time. Uh, Lone Rock had a great time, I hear. Um, how about you? Did you all have a great time? Hmm. 
Cruz. Not big response here. Oh well. Um, welcome to Hapner Christian Church, and we do have Dick preaching today, bringing the message, and we we also have a potluck after church. So that's something you can look forward to. And am I missing anything else? Bible studies, they're all on now. We're back on the regular schedule. Okay. Where do we go from here? Get her done, huh? Okay, I'm going to open with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come here to worship you, to study your word, to fellowship. I just pray that you'd be with Dick as he brings the message. And I pray that uh, those that couldn't make it today, for various reasons, I pray that you'd be with them. Uh, just let them know that, uh, let us, help us to let them know that they were missed and that we will look forward to seeing them next week. And I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, I guess we will open by uh, repeat Romans 5, 8 after me, would you? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Forty-two, one and two. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. Let's stand as we continue singing.
Philippians 2 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Yeah, this children's story is going to the dogs. Let's see the first slide. About a month ago, uh, there was a dog and people training session. One of the best dog handlers in the country came up to Lexington, Oregon to teach dogs to get along with people and people to get along with dogs and work the stock together. So let's see the next slide. Now here we see me and my dog working out in the arena. Dottie is the job there, Dottie's my dog. Dottie's dog is to bring the cattle to me. And you can see Dottie is bringing the cattle to me. We are learning to work together. Okay, next slide. Well, we had lots of different uh, dog handlers Here's the youngest students we had. See there, the, the dog and uh, its master are learning to chase sheep. Next slide. And here they are again. Okay, next slide. This is the bleachers where the students are learning. They are watching the dogs out in the arena. 
They want to learn how to work stock well. Okay, next slide. Well, that little dog isn't tall enough to look over and see in the arena, so she sat on my lap. Okay, next slide. Okay, here we are again. You can look through the fence there and see the cows. There's a, a dog and a handler and the trainer all there in the arena, and these dogs are watching. All except Max. Press the button again. See Max laying down there? Max knows it all. He doesn't have to watch and learn, because in his mind, he knows everything. Now, Max actually is a very smart dog. Every Tuesday, he goes to the sale barn there at Hermiston, and he goes... They send him down the alley, he goes down, and someone opens the gate for him, and he empties the pen, brings all the cattle on up to the sale ring. And then when they've gone through the ring, why, he takes them back. So he works for a living. He's a smart dog. He has competed in stock dog trials with novice handlers, people that are beginners, and he does pretty good at that. Trouble is, Max knows it all. He is t teaching the people that are working with him how to do it. He does it his way. So he will never win an open trial because he's not willing to listen to do it what the handler says. Okay, next slide. Oh, there's Max again. See, he's laying there just watching or just taking a nap while all the other dogs are up there trying to learn. Okay, next slide. Now, here we see on the screen, Blake Knowles is preparing to wrestle a steer. But look down here in the corner, up above Sam's head. See, there is Gator. Gator is watching television. Okay, Gator's a cow dog, and he only watches educational TV. He does not waste his time on stupid things like Disney stories or Saturday morning cartoons. In fact, he doesn't even spend much time watching the, the cowboys at the rodeos riding bucking horses. What he does watch is like steer wrestling and calf roping and steer roping because he's a cow dog. He learns practical stuff. Ever think that you ought to learn some practical stuff? Let's see the next slide. Now, you see two horses. Uh, Gator's head is blocking your view. You can't see the steer. But what you can see is when we got the steer wrestlers on, Matt, uh, Gator has climbed up on the, his pillow so he gets a better view of the television set. Okay. Now let's... See the next slide. Now, Gator is watching the steer leave the arena. See his head's cocked over? He's really watching what's going on. Okay, next slide. Okay. That is steer wrestling. Now, steer wrestling, if you haven't ever seen it before, is where a big dumb cowboy jumps off a perfectly good horse at 34 miles an hour onto a set of steer horns and ends up in a pile like you saw there on the screen. Gator watched that real close. Okay, let's one more slide. Don't play it yet. This is Gator working in a stock dial dog trial. He is his job is to take three cows and drive them through obstacles. Now, the cows have to stay together, or if they don't stay together, then he can't get them through the obstacles. So it's his job to keep them together and get them through the obstacles. Sometimes you get a cow that wants to leave the group and doesn't pay attention, you know, and it messes him all up. But Gator's in charge here. Now go ahead and show that. You're going to see a wow. 
Gator learned steer wrestling, <laughs> watching television. That was the first time we ever saw him do that, but he's done it since then when cattle get out of line. Okay, we'll show that one to you again. Go ahead. There we go. See the white one taken off, and Gator gets it and throws it down. And now he's in a position to chase him, chase that steer back to the two black ones that it's supposed to be with. Now, what I want you kids to get from this is, if you will notice what goes on around you and think about the things that are good and the things that are useful, by the time you grow up, you may grow up to be as smart as a border collie. Okay, you can go with CJ. Did you guys learn anything out of that too? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's stand as we prepare for communion. John nineteen eighteen, <clears throat> where they crucified him and with him two others one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And it's grace so free is sufficient That's why. Well, Dick, I thought Gator could have broke the barrier. <laughs> um, John chapter 1, John the Baptist gives this confession in front of many that were standing there. He said, when Jesus walked by, he says, Behold, the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew, he was part of that group standing there and him and another unnamed disciple followed Jesus to where he was at and Andrew becomes one of his disciples and then Andrew goes to his brother Peter and brings him and Jesus finds Philip and Philip tells Nathaniel and at John 1 45 we have this exchange with Philip and Nathaniel. Philip findeth Nathaniel and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Now Nathaniel's skeptical statement, I mean, there is some truth to that statement, but Jesus is from way further back than Nazareth. Jesus came from heaven from the Father. John said it, or Jesus said it, John 6, 38, for I come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of 
him that sent me. Apart from God, there is no good thing that will come from anyone. And Paul, writer of over half the New Testament, knows that apart from God, no good thing can be expected from anyone, even himself, or any world leader. Look, what Paul, look how Paul views himself in Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For I... For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Today, all through the country, society, and the world, everything seems to be lining up with a message that God spoke of in Isaiah 5.20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, to put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And then also Isaiah 59, 14. And judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. This condition just didn't happen overnight. Man thinks very highly of themselves. My grandmother was always telling us not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. And there are multiple verses that fit that thought. In 1946, the president of Dartmouth College, John Sloan Dickey, speaking to the graduating class, said this, there's nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. Then you fast forward to 2010, the Dartmouth College president Jim Young Kim said this to the graduating class, you are the better beings we have all been waiting for. Really? That's nuts. Without a doubt, godless comments. I would translate these statements as we don't need God. 64 years of godless thinking at Dartmouth College and we've since advanced another 14 years. That's 78 years elevating man over God. Can we chalk it up to maybe just positive thinking? Genesis 3, 5, 1 to 5, gives us an example of positive thinking. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, or, you, or lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God does know that in that day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan's positive thinking, and ye shall be as gods. Seems to run in lockstep with Dartmouth College. And God gives us also a peek at what God thinks of man or thinks of the better human being, so to speak. In Romans 1, 18 to 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And behold, the truth in unrighteousness because that which was made known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and God Godhead so that they are without cause because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but 
became vain in their imaginations and their foolishness, foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the, of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. That would be a great model for today's colleges. Dartmouth College thinks better human beings is the fix. And we know God's word says that's more the problem. The fix is the Lord Jesus Christ, his shed blood for the world. There is no other, there's no way for man to elevate themselves and fix any problem apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. In our communion time, just loudly speaks of that. And just some other closing verses. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And the Lord wants us to have insight of what's going on. Job 24, 1. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Our Father, we just thank you for this time that we can gather here as believers and remember where the, the true fix comes, and that's from the sending of your Son, his taking our punishment to the cross, shedding his blood for each and every one of us. And we just, as a body of believers, we just put all of our trust in that, in Jesus' name. Amen. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, the solid ground. Just bow and scorn The heights of love With depths of peace When fears are obscured When striving cease My comforter My all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Christ alone See if I can work this thing. Gadgets always get the best of me. 
You know, this, this message came about because I got a hold of a book called Cold, Cold Case Christianity. And uh, this was a, a cold case homicide detective wrote the eight steps that he uses to solve cold cases. And as I read through it, I began to realize if we would use those steps, it would, we could just totally demolish cultic doctrine and pseudoscience evolutionism simply by using these simple steps to come to the, the correct answer of what's going on. So I put, I'm putting together a, uh, a series on this subject. And uh, when I first read the first, uh, the first step, uh, which is don't be a know-it-all, I thought, hey, that's easy. I mean, I know all about that. I used that all my life. You know, the first rule in the cold case detective work is don't be a know-it-all. And so our text today is Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Now, know-it-all has all the answers, but not, frequently not all the necessary evidence, or else just neglects the necessary evidence. The know-it-all jumps to conclusions before he has the proof, and he may be jumping to confusions. Now, what I did, I thought, well, hey, this first one, that's there's not much to that. Everybody knows it. But then... You know, it's the first rule, it's obvious, it's simple. But when I started contemplating it, I begin to realize just how frequently I make a fool of myself by not following it. And uh, everyone knows it, but do we use it? You know, once I started thinking about it, I think, hey, I'm not using this very much. And it, it covers a wide variety of things. You know, yesterday I filled a weed eater full of uh, gasoline and went out and started using the weed eater. Well, I finished up on that project, put it down. While later I needed to go a quarter of a mile down the pasture and use the weed eater. So I went in there and thought, well, I just filled it with gas. It's ready to go. I knew it all. But I did take and look, and, you know, I must have finished up on the fumes. <laughs> you know, because it was empty. Now, just simple things like that, we jump to conclusions, and there's a whole lot more places we do it. Now, do we try to judge a person's motives on scant evidence? Anyone that's a parent has experienced that, you know, why did they do that stupid thing? They're just trying to be disobedient. Or how did they come up with that brilliant idea and, you know, what was the cause? And maybe the whole thing was they didn't bother to think. It just uh, came natural at the time. You know, we jump to confusions about people's intentions. You know, more damage in human relations comes from us assuming that uh, someone's motives are not good. But if we think it through, maybe their motives were excellent. Now here's another example. Do we know who or what we vote for? Did we really study it out ahead of time? Now, the other rules of cold case detective work are totally useless without this first rule. Because if our mind's made up, we miss the information. We don't interpret the evidence right. So let's take a little more complicated case 
uh, police investigation. It's actually simple enough that I think we can grasp the, the principles pretty good from it. The known facts of the case. 57 years ago, and that makes it a cold case, a 1967, in 1967, a 64 Ford car with a T-Bird interceptor, interceptor engine in it ran off the road. Now, who puts a 450-horse engine in a standard car? The driver and two passengers were in their early 20s. It was a fatal rollover. They went rolled over on the right side of the road on a curve to the right. Okay, there were short skid marks where he left the road. Now, the driver had driven that road at high speed for several years. His parents' house was on that road. Well, here's a picture of what it looks like today. It doesn't, the corner isn't really justified on that picture. Um, but he left the road about where that uh, uh, railroad tie is sticking up and ended up clear over there at the upright for the irrigation system. And on the right-hand side there, what you see is about a three-foot drop off to the right, which means when he went off the road, it would get the car rolling. Now, this happened at night. The highway was dry. The car ran off the road after the end of the corner. No, it just kept right on turning. The car rolled a long ways and was badly damaged. The police said that speed caused the driver to lose control. Now, there's no doubt he was driving too fast. He and he for sure lost control or he wouldn't have wrecked. But why did he lose control? The police said the cause was speed. He was just driving too fast and he lost control. But the police were wrong. The police investigators broke the first rule of cold case uh, detective work twice. Make sure you get all the evidence, first of all, and make sure you consider all the evidence. The police ignored two evidences that indicated speed did not cause the wreck, it caused the driver to lose control. Now, that's as far as I'm going to go with this. You've got the evidences. We'll talk about what did make him lose control when we learn how to infer, how to use the evidence to come up with the answers. Now, in veterinary medicine, we have a saying, you know, diagnostic work, common things occur commonly. You know, or when you hear hoofbeats, look for horses. If there are no horses, then you look for zebras. <laughs> well, in this case, there were no horses, but uh, we can't blame, really blame the police for missing the, the cause of the wreck. Because, hey, this is natural. They investigate Car wreck after car wreck caused by some driver going too fast, missing a corner. It's just natural to assume that that's what happened in this case. It's just that isn't what happened in this case. See, I presented two pieces of information that indicate that speed did not cause the driver to lose control. And when we learn to infer, we will go over them. And we'll show that the police jump to confusions. But let's take another example, a little more complex, the case of the origin of the universe. Either God created the universe or he did not. I mean, we've got a choice. It's one or the other. God said he did. Evolution said he did not. If God didn't create the universe, then how to get here? It had to create itself. 
So creationists, Christians, say it was a miracle performed by a force outside of time, space, and matter. Atheists say it happened by random chance, by the natural laws of chemistry and physics. So let's examine the situation here in light of what the atheists have to say. No miracles or outside force was involved, they said. So do evolutionists break the first rule of detective work? Are they jumping to confusions? They say there's no designer or creator. They say the universe came into existence by time and chance as a result of the laws of chemistry and physics. No, it's just scientific laws. Well, let's take a look at the school textbooks and see what they do have to say. In the, this is a, a high school text. Uh, in the realm of the universe, nothing really means nothing. Well, that makes sense. However, physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, the universe began in a, a gigantic explosion about 16 and a half billion years ago. This theory of the origin of the universe is called the Big Bang Theory. So, how did, do evolutionists say the universe created itself? Well, here's plan one. We just looked at it in the textbooks. Nothing exploded and created everything. Hmm. Have you seen nothing explode? I'm watching nothing explode right now. <laughs> the first law of thermodynamics says matter and energy are interchangeable and are neither created nor destroyed. So then, nothing could not explode and create everything according to the first law of thermodynamics. Okay. The first law of thermodynamics, of thermodynamics tells us the universe did not create itself from nothing. The universe started with an explosion of nothing and the laws of science were broken. That's what they're telling us. So, once people realize first there was nothing and then it exploded, isn't too logical, we have plan two. When nothing exploded does not convince the students, the textbooks tells us that the universe has always existed. The second law of thermodynamics says usable energy is lost in every reaction that produces energy. Okay, here's another school textbook. Most astronomers believe that about 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. For some unknown reason, this region exploded. This explosion is called the Big Bang. So plan two starts with matter and energy always existing. Now, it says all matter in the universe was compressed into one tiny dot, no bigger than a period on this page. That was one heavy dot, pretty crowded too. For some unknown reason, this dot exploded, producing everything. You know, if I told a whopper like that, when I was a kid, I might have got my mouth washed out with soap. The second law of thermodynamics, again, says that usable energy is lost in every reaction that produces energy. Now, if the universe has always existed, then by now, there would be nothing left, there would be no matter left, it'd be nothing left, but low-grade, unusable heat energy. So that this plan two doesn't work either. With enough time, the universe would run out of usable energy. Houston, we have a problem. The universe had a beginning, obviously, according to all natural law. 
The universe couldn't start without breaking the laws of science. Evolutionists claim a miracle without a miracle worker. Atheists say they don't believe in miracles. So here's what they come up with, if you can go with their big words. A singularity, a temporary suspe suspension of natural law, something that happened only once, a miracle. I got that from an evolutionist. Here we go. The Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle transcending physical principles. And that's by Paul Davies, an eminent uh, British astronomer and uh, evolutionist. Evolutionists say the universe created itself using the known laws of chemistry and physics. They claim a singularity, a miracle, with no singularity worker. Is this logical? Houston, we have a problem. The Big Bang Theory is contradicted by the laws of science. Two contradictory statements can't both be true at the same time and place. We would have to conclude that the atheist belief in evolution is illogical. Now, deists such as Einstein get around the problem of saying there was an outside force, or around the problem by saying there was an outside force, a god, that created the universe but he's irrelevant to us. Einstein believed in a force, and one of the popular quotes from Einstein is, I don't believe that God plays dice with the world. <coughs> Translated into cowboy English, he's saying that uh, he believes that this outside force is logical and or organized and consistent. But here we have in Romans, and Randy read it to us this morning, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the universe are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Seems that... Uh, God contradicts Einstein. But why do people believe in evolution when it's so, even the very start of it uh, is totally illogical? Well, the first reason, some people don't believe in God because they lack evidence. You know, for years they've been pushing God out of the education system. So we get stuff like you read in the, like the two uh, pictures of uh, books I put up there. The people believe in evolution simply because they don't have any evidence. They don't know any better. Some people don't believe in God because they don't like God's rules. A number of the leading evolutionists have actually stated that publicly that that is the reason they don't believe in uh, creation. Elitists don't want us to believe in God because they want us to obey them instead of God. Remember back in the Old Testament when Jeroboam took over the ten tribes from Rehoboam and he built two golden calves for the people to worship. He changed their religion so they wouldn't go down to Jerusalem and worship God and possibly rejoin with the other two tribes. Same thing here. Elitists don't want us to think for ourse ourselves. They want us to obey them instead of God. You know, the teaching of evolution has a very strong base in politics. Science is a search for truth using the tools of observation and logic. Look what 
Sir Arthur Keith wrote in the introduction to the 1928 edition of Darwin's Origin of Species. Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is spatial creation, which is unthinkable. Atheists break the first rule of cold case detective work. They have jumped to confusions. Don't be a know-it-all. Gather the evidence before you make your conclusions. Just don't jump to confusions. Evidence for a creator is ignored. Here's another quote. Science fundamentally is a game. It is a game with one overriding and defining rule. Rule number one. Let us see how far and to what extent we can explain the behavior of the physical and material universe in terms of purely physical and material causes without evoking the supernatural. When you define science as naturalism and leave the supernatural out, you have to leave out the evidence. Evidence for the Creator is ignored. The Apostle Paul said, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Avoid the pseudoscience of evolution. Now, there's other ways to break the first rule of detective work. Have you ever filled out a ballot without knowing what the candidate you voted for stands for? You know, you get a ballot and it looks kind of like an intelligence test. In an intelligence test, you get a higher score if you guess right on those multiple guess questions. So people fill out ballots the same way and they flunk their intelligence test. You know, this thing just sneaks in on us we just jump to conclusions or do something without thinking about it. It comes naturally. Have you ever judged someone's motives and then found out you were wrong? Have you ever blamed someone for something and then found out it was your, your fault? You know, I've, I've made a fool of myself so many times. You know, do we think it through? You know, if we would just take and when we're making decisions, kind of think of this first rule of cold case detective work, we'd be far ahead and make wiser decisions. Don't be a know-it-all. Gather all the evidence. Examine all the evidence. Check to see if you have adequate evidence. You know, tragically, an awful lot of the decisions we have to make, we don't have all the evidence we need. I mean, Randy's guilty all the time. He hadn't got a clue if it's going to rain or how much or when. He just goes charging out there and puts seed in the ground, right? He has to make a decision based on the evidence he's got, which means it's probably going to rain some, and he hopefully is going to get a crop. You know, and we, we have to do the same sort of thing, but we should utilize every bit of evidence we can. Now, President Roosevelt decided Japan would never attack Pearl Harbor. I mean, he ha had that in his mind, <coughs> and so he was concentrating on other things. He told Admiral Kim Kimmel... There was no worry of a Japanese attack. So, every weekend, Admiral Kimmel brought the fleet into Pearl Harbor, and he played golf. You know, Admiral Kimmel sent out two patrols every day to patrol the ocean. They followed the same pattern every time, which means all the Japanese had to do was learn where the patrols were flying, and they could very easily avoid being seen. 
Now, the military intelligence ignored the fact that in October, an entire Japanese fleet disappeared in the winter fog. And here it is November, and they still haven't found that fleet. You know, it's out there in the Pacific somewhere. But they just don't seem to be too worried about it because the commander-in-chief says the Japanese will never attack Pearl Harbor. Then military intelligence intercepted Japanese messages a week before the attack. Admiral Kimmel wasn't even warned. In fact, they had a month before the attack, they had a lot of warning in the code breaking room. Trouble was, it, it was hard to get any information to the president because if they told any of his cabinet, they would tell the Russians who would leak it to the Germans. <laughs> Who would leak it to the Japanese? It was a mess. There was one army officer who warned they're going to attack us at Pearl Harbor. And he, he even come up with a logical date, but it was before the attack. And uh, people uh, and the rest of the officers started poo-pooing his idea that it, the Japanese were going to attack. Well, a week. See, that would be December 1, 1941. They intercepted a message that there was no doubt the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor soon. Well, they intercepted on a weekend, and everybody wanted to go home for the weekend at the code breaking uh, room, and so they ignored it. Then finally, three days That'd be the 4th of uh, December. Uh, the army officer that said they're going to attack and we need to warn General Kimball, or Admiral Kimball, finally got permission to send a message to Admiral Kimball. Well, the other officer said, look, I mean, he's in charge. He knows to look out for, the, for enemy attack. You're insulting his intelligence to warn him. Again, not so bright. Well, the orders were, send a message to Admiral Kimmel by the fastest safe route. Well, at that point, the Army's uh, cable to Hawaii was out of commission. The Army guys didn't want to admit to the Navy that their cable was out of commission they could have sent a message immediately, directly, through the Navy's cable, but instead, they sent it by Western Union, which had multiple stops along the way. The message arrived in General, or Admiral Kimmel's office at, uh, in the afternoon of December 7th. The Japanese pilots were already back and finished their lunch by the time Admiral Kimmel got the message. Jumping to confusions, you know, you get an idea in your mind and you go with that idea in spite of the evidence because it, that idea is already in your mind. It, it's a foundation for your thinking. It, Isaiah warned us, he says, woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And Proverbs 18, 13 again, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Get the information and then make the decision. Information doesn't do us any good if we don't use it. Like there in the code room, they had the information, but they didn't use it till it was too late. You know, just Roosevelt's Jumping to confusions, being a know-it-all here, cost 3,000 American sailors' lives. You know, sometimes being a know-it-all has major consequences. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass out on and are punished. Hmm. Proverbs 27, 12, and 22, 3. 
A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Do we pay attention to the information, the evidence we have? We all know the first rule of detective work. It's simple. It's obvious. He that answers an, a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. But how often do we make fools of ourselves by neglecting it? Andrew, I believe you were to take over at this point. I sure didn't, did I? So in closing, um, and Dick, I appreciated your words you said. Uh, in closing, I, I just have one passage I wanted to share with you. Uh, I believe it's found in Psalms. Um, 53 and if you want to turn there um, basically it says the fool has said in his heart there is no guard uh, and is no God they are corrupt and have committed abominable injustice there is no one who does good um, I'd love to say that uh, Admiral Kimmel was the only guy who was uh, uh, wrong there the president was the only guy that's wrong but there was a series of errors and um, a lot of times a series of errors are everything that we do uh, to try to justify ourselves before God when God made it really simple for us. He says, hey, Jesus died for you. And um, he understands the relationship you have with the Father and you're out of relationship unless um, you're with Jesus. Um, really appreciate Randy's words this morning as well. Took us on a journey. Um, we hold what is it, uh, um, the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world? Um, this morning, if you don't know Jesus, um, that's the starting point on a journey forward and trusting in God that um, he's never late. He's also never early. He's always on time, and um, we need to know that. Um, so let's go ahead and have a, a closing prayer. Uh, are we going to do... Are we going to do the trivia before the invitation, prayer, trivia, and prayers? No, no, no. But let's let's do the prayers, and uh, as the as the worship team comes forward, and um, I just want to make sure I was in the right right place there. So let's go ahead and pray. Um, precious Heavenly Father, I just pray that uh, um, we would not. Uh, be like the fool who said there is no God and like the scientists who have said uh, we see this beautiful creation but we know that a uh, God couldn't have created it because um, with no evidence um, your evidence is clearly visible and uh, clearly you care for us on a daily basis and love us so much I pray that we would respond to that we ask this in Jesus name Amen.
go ahead and be seated. Yes, I guess we have a trivia next. Thank you, Andy. Okay, let's see if we can get it because, oh, we've got our master trivia right in the back row there. Way back. Yeah, so, so we do have hope. So what words finishes this quote from the fear of the Lord is the beginning of? Um, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What is it? The fear of uh, knowledge. 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 Okay. Uh, according to the uh, uh, Proverbs 1 7, what was the beginning of knowledge? The fear of the Lord. Okay. According to Proverbs 4 6, who will guard you if you love her? That'd be wisdom, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And wisdom can be found in the simplest of places. Uh, which insect does Proverbs praise for its work? Go thou sluggard to the ant. Yeah, okay. Cool, cool. Wow. It's brutal. Okay. <laughs> well, we're to uh, praise and prayer time. Um, do we have any praises out there this morning? Levi? Oh, no, hold on a second here. You hear what I just asked first. Do we have any praises? We'll get to prayer requests, but first I want to talk about praises. What praises do we get out there this morning? Yeah. Before our week in Little Rock turned out very nice for all the radar. Thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Yeah. It was a blessing to go out there and, and worship with some folks out there. It was a serious blessing. So there's that. Um, brothers and sisters in Christ. Any other praises out there this morning? Beautiful weather. Great weather. Oh, yes. You know, we prayed for Waylon. He spent a whole month in the NICU. He is a gaining baby gang. He is one of the most animated babies. I'm a little precious. But, um, I wonder why. You know, I. Thank you, you, and thank you all for your prayers. Pastor. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That's a blessing. So, um, praise for Waylon. Okay. Any other praises this morning? I will. <clears throat> I looked at a video that was sent by my son, Travis, and I don't know, a year ago, his son was in the hospital for two or three months, yeah. and he, he basically almost drowned in a pool. Well, the video showed him diving into the pool, unafraid, and just being a normal young boy. So that's a praise. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. Any other praises? Well, my friend Kat at the bottom of there. Is, is, that, a, is that, that a praise, praise. as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a praise here. Uh, Kat's hand and arm are beginning work. Remember, Kat is a friend of Candy's, and she had a stroke. How long ago? About three weeks ago. About three, three weeks. weeks ago? And uh, she had lost some mobility there, and she's already um, gaining some of that mobility back with the hand and arm being at work, and she is gaining the strength to walk as well. So that's a super praise as well. That's awesome. Okay. Do we have any um, prayer requests this morning? <laughs> okay. 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 Um, George, George Nairs. Yeah. George North. George North. Yeah. The grandson? Who, who passed away? Judy's son. Judy's son? Yes. Okay. 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 And um, any other prayer requests out there? Yes. Was it expected or yes. no? Okay. Okay. And uh, then any other prayer requests? Um, Laura. Okay. Um, got a couple here. Uh, Levi had one. Oh, Levi, that was that one. Um, and then a prayer request. Uh, Candy shared this. Laura's uh, friend, um, her stomach is not processing food? It's not recognizing any food has been put in it, so oh, it's okay. not processing anything. Okay. 
Okay. So stomach's not working. Yes. We'll do, we'll do. Um, any other prayer requests? So I'm going to tell you straight up, guys, I'm, I'm not as good as uh, Quentin at remembering these things. Um, so we're going to have a short time of uh, silent prayer, and then we'll go to God um, as a group, and I'll close, um, and we'll be praying, not only for those situations, but um, um, uh, even for those uh, situations out there that are unspoken. Um, the cares that are on your heart, um, the Lord says, cast them on him. And, and so let's bring them before the Lord this morning and, uh, and, and pray and continue to keep those folks and those situations in prayer, um, both for the praises and, and for the prayer requests. So let's go ahead and pray. Precious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for um, your blessings, your mercy, and your grace. The fact that uh, you were there with us um, as we walk through the valley and the shadow of death. As, uh, as, uh, as we go through pain and sorrow, um, you're there. And not only there to go through that with us, um, but in your time and in your ways uh, um, to make sure that those folks that are going through that receive your love, your care, your compassion, your healing, um, your blessings. And dear Lord, we know that uh, this world isn't always fun, um, the things that happen. Uh, death is very real. Um, pain, sorrow, sickness is very real. Just place your hand of care and healing on each situation here. And, but we praise you for answered prayer in each situation as well. And precious Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And it's in your son's name, son's name, Jesus. We ask this. Amen. Yeah. Okay, as we prepare to close, would you stand, please? <clears throat> downstairs for potluck today. You are dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>